The Spooky Kids. Marilyn Manson was the perfect story protagonist for a frustrated writer like myself. He was a character who, because of his contempt for the world around him, and more so himself, does everything he can to trick people into liking him. And then, once he wins their confidence, he uses it to destroy them. He would have been in a longish story, about 60 pages. The title would have been The Payback, and it would have been rejected by 17 magazines. Today, it would be in the garage of my parents' house in Florida, faded and mildewed with all the other stories. But it was too good an idea to rot. The year was 1989, and Miami's two live crew were beginning to make headlines because store owners across the country were getting arrested for selling their albums, classified as obscenity, to minors. Pundits and celebrities were rushing to aid the band to prove that their lyrics were not titillation but art. A culturally significant chain of events had been set in motion simply because of dirty nursery rhymes like Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet with her legs gaped open wide. Up came a spider, looked up inside her, and said that pussy's wide. At the time, I was reading books about philosophy, hypnosis, criminal psychology, and mass psychology, along with a few occult and true crime paperbacks. On top of that, I was completely bored and sitting around watching Wonder Years reruns and talk shows and realizing how stupid Americans were. All of this inspired me to create my own science project and see if a white band that wasn't rap could get away with acts far more offensive and illicit than Two Live Crew's Dirty Rhymes. As a performer, I wanted to be the loudest, most persistent alarm clock I could be because there didn't seem like there was any other way to snap society out of its Christianity and media-induced coma. Since nobody was publishing my poetry, I convinced Jack Kearney, the owner of Squeeze, a small club in the middle of a mall, to start an open mic night. That way, I could at least get some exposure for my writing. Every Monday I stood awkward and vulnerable behind the microphone on a small stage and recited a handful of poems and prose pieces to a meager crowd. All the bizarre characters who attended told me my poetry sucked, but I had a good voice and should start a band. I told them to fuck off, but inside I knew that no one really likes poetry anyway and that their advice was right if only because no one else I interviewed or listened to was writing songs with any intelligence. I had always dreamt of making music because it was such an important part of my life, but until then, I never had the confidence or the faith in my abilities to pursue it seriously. All I needed were a few resilient souls to go through hell with me. The Kitchen Club was the epicenter of South Beach Miami's burgeoning underground industrial scene and a regular haunt of mine from the time it opened that year tucked inside a sleazy hotel populated by prostitutes, drug addicts, and vagrants. There was a pool in the back with water filthy from being used as a combination bathtub, laundromat by alcoholics who had pissed and shat themselves. I would go to the hotel on a Friday night, rent a room, and by the end of the weekend find myself alone and miserable, puking in the bathtub from ingesting too much trucker speed and too many screwdrivers. One Friday, I arrived at the club with a friend from theater class, Brian Tutanik. I was decked out in a navy blue trench coat with Jesus Saves painted on the back, striped stockings, and combat boots. At the time, I thought I looked cool, but in retrospect, I looked like an asshole. Jesus Saves. As we walked in, we noticed a blonde guy leaning against a pillar with a flock of seagulls haircut hanging in his face. He was smoking a cigarette and laughing. I thought he was laughing at me, but when I passed by, he didn't even turn his head. He was just staring into space, cackling like a madman. As Layback's Yugoslavian military march version of Life is Life blasted out of the sound system, I spotted a girl with black hair and huge breasts, which, when they were on a goth girl like her, we called Dracula Biscuits. Shouting over the music, I explained to her that I had a hotel room and tried to convince her to come up with me, but for the 99th time that summer, I was denied because she had come to the club with a date, which turned out to be the laughing boy. She brought me to his pillar, and I asked him what he was laughing about. His response came in the form of a tutorial on the proper ways to commit suicide, which included essential details like the exact angle to hold the shotgun at and what type of ammunition to use. 
The whole time he had a strange way of laughing at everything he said. He would just start cackling, and within that cackle, he'd repeat what he had just said, a word like 12-gauge or cerebral cortex, so that both you and he knew what was so funny. His name was Stephen, but, he explained in the ensuing seminar, if anyone called him Steve, it pissed him off. If anyone spelled his name with a V instead of a PH, it pissed him off, too. The subject of names didn't change until Ministries Stigmata came on and the goths and pseudo-punks stopped dancing and started violently slamming. Much of the commotion was instigated by an effeminate, Crispin Glover-looking guy with purple hair, a miniskirt, and a leopard-skin leotard. He would eventually become our second bassist. Completely oblivious to the activity around him, Stephen told me that if I liked ministry, I should listen to Big Black. He then delved into a detailed analysis of Steve Albini's guitar playing, the techniques he used and the tones he produced, followed by a dissertation on Albini's methods of production and the lyrical content of his album, Songs About Fucking. I didn't get laid that night, which pissed me off, though it was nothing new, but I did exchange numbers with Steven. He called me the next week and said he wanted to make me a cassette of Songs About Fucking and bring me something else he thought I'd be extremely interested in. He wouldn't say what it was. He just wanted to come over and give it to me. Instead of Big Black, he brought me a tape of a band called Rape Man, and he spent several hours extemporizing on the lineage between the two bands, rocking back and forth autistically all the while. I later learned he had a problem with hyperactivity as a child, which his parents had treated with Ritalin. Now that he wasn't on medication, he often turned into a babbling blur that was dizzying to watch. His mystery surprise was a rusty can of spiced sardines that had expired in June 1986. He never offered an explanation for it, and I never figured one out. Maybe he thought I was going to pull an Andy Warhol and make silk screens of it. We began spending a lot of time together, hanging out at my poetry readings and going to concerts by shitty South Florida bands that I thought were halfway decent at the time. After a show one night, we came back to my house and pawed through poems I wanted to turn into songs and lyrical scraps I had written. I was hoping he played an instrument since he seemed to know everything there was to know about all things electrical, mechanical, and pharmaceutical. So I asked. The answer came in the form of a long-winded monologue about how his brother was a jazz musician and played a variety of reed, keyboard, and percussion instruments. Eventually he confessed, I can play drums, <laughs> drums, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> But my vision didn't include drums. I wanted to start a rock band that used a drum machine, which seemed somewhat novel at the time since only industrial, dance, and hip-hop bands used drum machines. Just buy a keyboard and we'll start a band, I told him. Steven didn't end up in the first incarnation of the group. Neither did the next person I found that I liked. I was at a record store in Coral Square Mall buying Judas Priest and Mission UK tapes as birthday presents for my cousin Chad. A well-tanned store employee who looked like an exotic Middle Eastern skeleton with an afro bigger than Brian May's walked over and tried to foist Love and Rockets albums on me. His name tag identified him as Jordy White. <clears throat> One of his co-workers, a girl named Lynn, had given blowjobs and much more to most of the South Florida scene, including, oh, excluding me, but including Jordy, though he denies it to this day. Almost a year later, Jordy and I would form a joke band called Mrs. Scab Tree and perform a song about Lynn's legacy to the music scene. It was called Herpes. Jordy sang it dressed like Diana Ross, and I played drums using a chamber pot as a stool. Jordy would go on to play in my band as Twiggy Ramirez, but for now, Jordy was just a friendly freak in a Bajas t-shirt trying to find someone who understood him. The next time I ran into Jordy at the mall, he was playing bass in a death metal outfit called Ambugalard. So I didn't even bother trying to persuade him to quit. I just asked him if he could recommend a good bass player, but instead, that, but he insisted that there weren't any in South Florida, and he was right. I ended up talking to Brian Tutnick, my friend from theater class, into playing bass with us. I knew this was wrong from the start because he'd been talking about forming his own band for some time and had no intention of including me. He may have thought he was doing me a favor when he joined Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids as part of the rhythm section 
instead of as the front man that he wanted to be, but it wasn't much of a favor, because he was a bad bassist, a fat hairdresser, a wannabe vegetarian, and a devotee of Boy George, which placed him at the bottom end of the aggressivity meter. He lasted two shows before we kicked him out. He wound up forming Collapsing Lungs, a bad, watered-down industrial metal band with songs like Who Put a Hole in My Rubber. They thought they were God's gift to South Florida, especially after they got signed to Atlantic Records, but I cursed them. Now they're God's gift to the unemployment line, though I can't entirely take credit for their downfall. Bad musicianship and industrial metal songs about saving sea turtles didn't help their career any. I found the next piece of the band at a drunken house party. An intoxicated, pie-faced twit with greasy brown hair and long monkey arms flopped onto the couch next to me, pretending he was gay and talking about the drapes. He introduced himself as Scott Putsky. He seemed to know a lot of technical information about music making, and even better, he owned a four-track cassette recorder. I had a concept, but no musical skills whatsoever, and I was easily impressed. Scott was the first real musician I had come in contact with, so I asked him to join the band and later rechristened him Daisy Berkowitz. He immediately proved to be a fuck up when I called him the day after the party and his abrasive mother rasped nasally at me. Sorry, Scott isn't here. He's in jail. I thought she was kidding, but it turned out he had been picked up for drunk driving on the way home from the party. Scott had been in several local rock and new wave bands before and almost everyone he worked with wanted to kill him because he was very pretentious and had deluded himself into thinking that he was much more talented than he actually was. Some people talk better than they play, but Scott did neither well. He always just knew what to do to annoy people. He would tell girls, you look great from the waist down, and think it was a compliment. I would have performed using my own name, but I needed a secret identity in order to write about my music in 25th Parallel, so I carefully chose a pseudonym a moniker with a magical ring to it like Hocus Pocus or Abracadabra. The words Marilyn Manson seemed an apt symbol for modern day America, and the minute I wrote it on paper for the first time, I knew that it was what I wanted to become. All the hypocrites in my life, from Miss Price to Mary Beth Kroger, had helped me to realize that everybody has a light and a dark side, and neither can exist without the other. I remember reading Paradise Lost in high school and being struck by the fact that after Satan and his angel companions rebelled against heaven, God reacted to the outrage by creating man so that he could have a less powerful creature companion in his image. In other words, in John Milton's opinion at least, man's existence is not just a result of God's benevolence, but also of Satan's evil. As a bipedal animal, man by nature, whether you call it instinct or original sin, gravitates toward his evil side, which may be one of the reasons people always ask me about the darker half of my name, but never about Marilyn Monroe. Although she remains a symbol of beauty and glamour, Marilyn Monroe had a dark side just as Charles Manson, Manson had a good, intelligent side. The balance between good and evil, and the choices we make between them, are probably the single most important aspects shaping our personalities and humanity. I could elaborate further, but it's all on the internet. Try the alt.life's only worthy living if you can post it online later news group. <clears throat> All I will add is that the first article written on Marilyn Manson was by Brian Warner, and he completely misunderstood what I was trying to do. At the time, Charles Manson had been resurrected as a news item in the television special in the name of Nielsen Ratings. In high school, I had bought his Lie album, which featured him singing bizarre, almost comical original songs like Garbage Dump and Mechanical Man, which I incorporated into one of my poems, My Monkey. I had a little monkey, I sent him to the country, and I fed him on gingerbread. Along came a choo-choo, knocked my monkey cuckoo, and now my monkey's dead. At least he looks that way. But then again, don't we all? What I make is what I am. I can't be forever. Mechanical Man was the beginning of my identification with Manson. He was a gifted philosopher, more powerful intellectually than those who condemned him. But at the same time, his intelligence, perhaps even more so than the actions he had others carry out for him, made him seem eccentric and crazy because extremes, whether good or bad, don't fit into society's definition of normality. Though Mechanical Man was a nursery rhyme on the surface, 
It also worked as a metaphor for AIDS, the latest manifestation of a man's age-old habit of destroying himself with his own ignorance, be it of silence, I'm sorry, science, religion, sex, or drugs. After we turned four or five of my poems and ideas into songs, we felt we were ready for South Florida to see our ugly faces, which we strategically covered with makeup. Unfortunately, Stephen still hadn't bought a keyboard, so we found an acne-faced nerd named Perry to fill in. Another problem that was that among sorry, another problem was that among the many neuroses that Christian school had instilled in me was a crippling stage fright. In fourth grade, the drama teacher chose me to portray Jesus in a school play. For the crucifixion scene, he wanted me to wear a loincloth. Forgetting the cruelty kids were capable of, I borrowed an old frayed terry cloth towel from my father and wore it without underwear. After dying on the cross, I walked backstage where several older kids yanked the towel off me, started whipping me with it, and chased me through the hall. It was your classic preteen nightmare come to life running down a corridor, naked, in front of all the girls you like and all the boys who hate you. Oddly, I got over my fear of exposing myself on stage, but I never never got over my resentment of Jesus for traumatizing me. Our first show was at Church Hill's Hideaway in Miami. Twenty people showed up, though now that we're famous, at least twenty-one claimed to have been there. Brian the Fat Hairdresser, name changed to our trademark Starlet turned serial killer combination of Olivia Newton Bundy played bass. Perry the pimple head, who renamed himself Zaja Speck without realizing the pun on his speckled complexion, played keyboards. And Scott the fascist of the four-track Daisy Berkowitz played guitar. We used Scott's Yamaha RX-8 drum machine, which like Scott would one day leave us, although the drum machine was never heard from again. Being very literal-minded, I wore a Marilyn Monroe t-shirt, but I added a Manson-style swastika to her forehead. Droplets of blood had leaked through the shirt, staining Marilyn Monroe's left eye, a result of my having had a potentially cancerous mole recently removed from beneath my nipple in the same spot where Jesus was wounded. Although the doctor warned me not to touch the area around the incision, soon as I returned home, I stretched the skin around it as tautly as I could. The results were my first new hobbies as Marilyn Manson. Scarification and body modification, which I further pursued with a plastic surgeon who clipped my drooling earlobes down to human size. The stage at Churchill's consisted of several pieces of plywood over rows of bricks, and the PA was basically a pair of Walkman headphones snapped apart and scotch taped to the wall on either side of the stage. We opened with one of my favorite poems, The Telephone. Quote, I am awakened by the incessant ringing of the telephone, I began, my croak turning into a growl as I wondered whether there was enough chaos on stage to hold the audience's attention. I still have dreams caked in the corners of my eyes, and my mouth is dry and tastes shitty. Again, the ringing. Slowly I bustle out of bed the remnants of an erection still lingering in my shorts like a bothersome guest. Again the ringing. Carefully I abscond to the bathroom so as not to display my manhood to others. There I make the perfunctory morning faces, which always seem to precede my daily contribution to the once blue toilet water that I always enjoy making green. Again the ringing. I shake twice like most others, as I am annoyed by the dribble that always seems to remain causing a small acreage of wetness on the front of my briefs. I slowly, languidly, lazily, crazily stumble into the den where my father smokes all the time. Cigars in his easy chair. Oh, the stench. The song went on, the concert went on, and I lost track of what I was doing until afterward when I rushed into the club bathroom and threw up in the toilet. I thought it had been a terrible show for watcher and performer alike. But a funny thing happened as I leaned over my putrid almagation, alma, god I suck, alma, whatever, of pizza, beer, and pills. I heard applause and suddenly I felt something rise inside me that wasn't vomit. It was a sense of pride, accomplishment, and self-satisfaction strong enough to eclipse my withering self-image and my punching bag past. It was the first time in my life I felt that way, and I wanted to feel like that again. I wanted to be applauded. I wanted to be 
pissed. I wanted to make people pissed. Side note, guys, I don't read very often. I have ADD and dyslexia, so I'm sorry for all the errors. Remember, I'm doing this for free for your enjoyment, so I'm really trying. Few stories in my life are without an anticlimax, and this one came as I was driving back to Fort Lauderdale at 3 a.m. that night in my mom's red Fiero. On the overpass arching above the crime-ridden ghetto of Little Havana, the digital radio blinked out in my car. I pulled over to the shoulder to see what was wrong and discovered that I couldn't restart the car. The alternator belt had snapped, and less than an hour after having found my true calling, I was stuck foraging for a phone by myself in Little Havana where the chances of, of a makeup streaked clown named Marilyn Manson not getting beat up were pretty slim. The only good that came out of the experience was that since the tow truck didn't arrive until 10 a.m., I got used to not sleeping after a concert early in my career. Our first real show took place at the reunion room. I booked it by telling the manager and DJ, Tim, listen, I've got this band and we're gonna play here and we want 500 bucks. Normally bands were paid 50 to 150, but Tim agreed to my price. That was lesson number one on music industry manipulation. If you act like a rock star, you will be treated like one. After the show, we kicked Pimplehead and the fat guy out of the band, and they no doubt went off to make sandwiches, squeeze zits, and star in the sitcom Pimplehead and the Fat Guy, which lasted for two episodes. We then lured Brad Stewart, the Crispin Glover lookalike from the Kitchen Club, away from a rival band, Insanity Assassin, which featured Joey Vomit on bass, and on vocals, Nick Rage, a short, stubby guy who had somehow tricked himself into thinking he was a tall, skinny, attractive guy. It wasn't hard to convince Brad to play bass with us, even though he had a guitar, sorry, even though he had played guitar with Insanity Assassin. Since we had similar music goals and better stage names, he became Gidget Gein. We let Steven join the band as Madonna Wayne Gacy, even though he didn't have a keyboard. Instead, he played with toy soldiers on stage. For better, but ultimately for worse, one more character ended up in our freak show. Her name was Nancy, and she was psychotic in all the wrong ways. She knew my girlfriend, Teresa, who was one of the first people I met after Rochelle had made a fool of me. I was seeking a motherly figure instead of a model's figure, and I found it at, at a Saigon Kick concert at the Button South. Teresa came from the same factory as Tina Potts, Jennifer, and most of the other girls I ended up with in Ohio. She had a slight overbite, tiny hands, and a blonde bob, not unlike Stevens. The two were perpetually mistaken for twins. I had seen Nancy once before when I worked at the record store, a hippo goth looking foolish in a black wedding gown. When Teresa introduced me to her a year later, Nancy had lost 50 pounds and had an I'm skinny and I'm gonna pay back the world for all the times when I was fat and didn't get fucked attitude. She had shoulder length black curly hair, floppy tits that hung out of a slutty tank top, Hispanic features, a pale face, and a permanent stench that was half flowery, half noxious. Once I told her about the performance art ideas I had for future shows, there was no escaping her. She pushed herself into the band like a tick working its way under an elephant's skin. Any idea I had that involved a girl, no matter how extreme or humiliating, she immediately volunteered for. Because she was willing, and I was desperate, and also since she seemed to like somebody other people would dislike as much as they disliked me, I gave in. Our antics quickly grew from tame to depraved. The first time we performed together, I sang while holding her on a leash the whole time to make a point about our patri patriarchal society, of course, not because it turned me on to drag a scantily clad woman around the stage by a leather leash. Soon afterward, Nancy asked me to punch her in the face, so I began giving her progressively crueler beatings each show. Circle 7, the violent, against their neighbors. It must have caused some brain damage because she began to fall in love with me, even though I was going out with Teresa, who was good friends with Nancy's boyfriend, Carl, a tall, goofy, well-meaning klutz, with big hips and a soft girlish figure. This lame, real-world situation was made even worse when Nancy and I began to explore sexuality as well as pain and dominance on stage. I made out with her and sucked her tits and she got on her knees and caressed whatever she found down there. 
Without fucking, we took it as far as we could without getting in trouble with my girlfriend, her boyfriend, or the law. During one concert, we put her in a cage, and as the band played People Who Died by the Jim Carroll Band, I revved up a chainsaw and tried to grind through the metal. But the chain flew off the blade, smacked me across the eyes, and made a huge gash in my forehead, sending blood streaking down my face. I barely made it through the rest of the show because all I could see was red. During one concert, sorry, like any good performance art, there was a message behind the violence. Most of the time I wasn't interested in inflicting pain on myself and others unless it was in a way that would make people think about the way they act, the society they live in, or the things they take for granted. Sometimes, as a concrete lesson in making assumptions, I would toss into the audience dozens of Ziploc bags, half of them filled with chocolate chip cookies, the other half with cat turds. I was also interested in the danger and menace of seemingly innocent children's movies, books, and objects. Like metal lunchboxes, which were banned in Florida because the state was worried kids would use them to beat each other senseless. During lunchbox, I regularly set a metal lunchbox on fire, took off all my clothes, and danced around it trying to exercise its demons. In an attempt to reiterate the lesson of Willy Wonka in my own style during other shows, I hung a donkey pinata over the crowd and put a stick on the edge of the stage. Then I would warn, please don't break this open. I beg you not to. <clears throat> Human psychology being what it is, kids in the crowd would invariably grab the stick and smash the pinata apart, forcing everyone to suffer the consequence, which in this case was a shower of cow brains, chicken livers, and pig intestines from a disemboweled donkey. People would slam dance and slip on this mass of now-spoiled meat, cracking their heads open in a total intestinal freakout. The outrageous stunts, however, came later, after a disastrous trip to Manhattan, during which I wrote my first real song. A girl with a pretentious name like Asia, who I had met while she was working at McDonald's in Fort Lauderdale, was spending the summer in New York and offered to fly me up for a weekend. Although I was going out with Teresa, I accepted, mainly because I didn't like Asia and just wanted a free trip to New York. I thought that maybe I could find a record executive to sign our band, so I brought along a crude demo tape. I was never happy with our demos, which Scott always recorded, because we sounded like a tinny industrial band and I imagined us playing raw or more immediate punk rock. Manhattan turned out to be a disaster. I discovered that Asia had lied to me about her name and age. She had used her sister's ID to get a job at McDonald's because she was too young. I got pissed. It wasn't that big a deal, but it was another case of a girl deceiving me and stormed out of her apartment. In the street, by a coincidence or not, I ran into two club rats from South Florida, Andrew and Susie, a couple of dubious sexuality. I always thought they looked sharp and stylish in clubs, but seeing them for the first time in daylight that afternoon, I realized that they used makeup in darkness to practice gothic deception. In the afternoon sun, they looked like decomposing corpses and seemed at least ten years older than me. In their hotel room, the cable system had public access channels, a completely new phenomenon to me. I spent hours flipping through the stations, watching Pat Robertson preach about society's evils and then ask people to call him with their credit card number. On the adjacent channel, a guy was greasing up his cock with Vaseline and asking people to call and give him their credit card number. I grabbed the hotel notepad and started writing down phrases. Cash in hand and dick on screen. Who said God was ever clean? I imagined Pat Robertson finishing his more righteous than thou patter then calling 1-900-Vaseline. Bible Belt, round Anglo waist, putting sinners in their place. Yeah, right, great, if you're so good, explain the shit stains on your face. Thus, Cake and Sodomy was born. I had written other songs I thought were good, but Cake and Sodomy was more than just a good song. As an anthem for a hypocritical America slobbering on the tit of Christianity, it was a blueprint for our future message. If televangelists were going to make the world seem so wicked, I was going to give them something real to cry about. And years later, they did. The same person who inspired Cake and Sodomy, Pat Robertson, went on to quote the song's lyrics and misinterpret them for his flock on the 700 Club. When I came back from New York, my real troubles began. 
Teresa was supposed to pick me up at the airport, but she never showed up, and nobody answered the phone at her house. So I called, I called Carl and Nancy, since they lived near the airport. Do you know where the fuck Teresa is? I asked. I had a shitty time in New York. I'm stuck at the airport with no fucking money. All I want to do is go home and sleep. Teresa's out with Carl, Nancy said, the cold tone of her voice betraying a hint of jealousy that I also felt. Nancy offered to pick me up and drive me home. When we arrived, she followed me inside. I just wanted to pass out, but I didn't want to be mean after she had rescued me. I collapsed onto the bed, and she collapsed on top of me, coming on to me heavier, all puns intended, than she ever had before. She rammed her tongue down my throat and grabbed my dick. I was very apprehensive, mostly because I didn't want to get caught. By now, I had begun to feel removed from the everyday world of morta morality. Guilt had become more a fear of getting caught than any sense of right or wrong. I ended up letting her give me a blowjob because Teresa never went down on me. But, as on stage, I wouldn't let her fuck me. When Teresa and Carl showed up at my house less than 15 minutes later, we were sitting on the bed innocently watching television. Carl instinctively walked up to Nancy and kissed her on the mouth, unaware that minutes ago that very orifice had received several million of my sperm. At the time, I thought it was funny and appropriately vengeful, but I didn't realize that this solitary act of fellatio would be the beginning of a six-month reign of full-on gothic terror.